How what's up, y'all? It's Poppin' Cracking. It's Dean about to react to this vid. It's titled Joker: How One Movie Destroyed an Entire Fan Base. Uh, they're talking about this new Joker movie with Lady Gaga. Um, did it already come out? People already hate it. <laughs> I saw the trailer and I was like, oh, I want to see it because I loved the first Joker movie. So yeah, I don't know what the problem is, but let's hear what people have to say. Let's watch. The new Joker movie will go down in history as one of the biggest cinematic U-turns ever seen. From the original being an Oscar-winning outstanding masterpiece to the sequel being one of the most boring, unnecessary, and hated movies of the year. Oh. There have been plenty of bad sequels throughout the years, but it takes a special yeah, kind of okay. movie to actively punish people who like the first movie. Despite how much people loved the first one, a sequel was a strange idea. Then as more details came out about the movie, it only got more confusing and more worrying. Barely anyone expected they would mess it up this badly though. Nearly every single thing that people liked about Joker has been taken out of its sequel. So let's dive in and find out how they screwed up the film this badly yeah. and where it all went so wrong. Now we've actually made a video in the past about the first Joker movie and how great it really was. It was full of societal meaning. It's not surprising that people were excited for the sequel when the first Joker film was so captivating. The original Joker touched the hearts and minds of millions of people around the world. But at first, on. people didn't really know what they were going to expect. It was going to be hard for anyone to follow Heath Ledger's Joker, a performance so chilling and sublime that it will be remembered for centuries to come. But Joaquin Phoenix's approach to the character and the gritty world that the film created won audiences over, becoming one of the best movies of the decade. It wasn't the same for the critics in Hollywood at large. At first, they had mixed opinions about the film. There were lots of talks about this creating an incel rebellion, that this film was just for loser young men, with many even fearing that this would lead to copycat crimes. But when absolutely nothing happened and they saw how much people really liked it, they were happy to pile on the awards, with Joker winning two Oscars later that year despite the lukewarm reception Hollywood gave it on release. While it might have been hard for critics to wrap their heads around it, the Joker explored themes that have become incredibly rare in modern movies. And I said that too. People was talking shit about the movie initially. Like, it's wild that sometimes it takes a while for people to be like, oh, it was a classic. Oh, it was a great movie. Like, bro. Because initially, I remember people talking a lot of shit about it. The critics were talking a lot of shit initially, and a lot of fans. We're talking shit. That's what I would see online. People would be like, oh, where's the action? And all oh, this is depressing and da-da-da-da. Like, I saw a lot of negativity about the movie before or when it came out. And it, it made me kind of not want to see it. When I finally saw it, I was like, this shit fired. <laughs> but I feel like by the time I saw it, people were talking about how great it was. And that's when it was getting all the awards. But initially, that was not the case. Part of the film's appeal was how it portrayed mental illness. Lots of movies have something to say about the so topic. I'm glad he highlighted that because I know I, I know the same raw honesty that Joker does. They often show it existing in its own little bubble, as though it's isolated from the rest of the world. There's usually one crazy character who's put at odds with the same world around them. But Joker went much deeper than that, exploring the interplay between mental illness and a society which creates it. Few other films really show how alienation and a hostile world play on someone's psyche. Joker showed how someone can reach out for help, get abandoned by the people around them, and the horrific results that can come from this. It's incredibly important that society understands how this happens. Most media today either demonizes these people or doesn't acknowledge them at all. But Joker went a long way towards breaking through those one-dimensional perceptions. All of these themes were perfectly tied together by Joaquin Phoenix's performance. It was clear how hard he had worked to perfect it. A lot of this was thanks to his physical performance and the way he brought the character to life. His sudden movements, his pained laughter, and how thin he got for the role really sold it. And if he didn't bring the story to life, then the set design and the overall atmosphere really did. It made the film reminiscent of Taxi Driver in more ways than just the plot. Their portrayal was of a grim, unforgiving city on the edge of chaos have only gotten more relevant as time has gone on. Joker was lightning in a bottle, tackling the issues with modern society that other films simply didn't acknowledge. It made it the second most profitable R-rated movie of all time, only getting dethroned this year. The story resonated with millions of people around the world. It was open-ended, with the film setting up various things that a sequel could explore. But it was mostly a self-contained story. As most people have mentioned by now, there really wasn't a need for a follow-up Joker film. And clearly this was meant to just be a standalone movie without ever setting up some franchise or new world. The director even said later on that there was never a plan to turn it into a series. I mean this as, as a compliment. I love this movie so much, I almost don't want there to be a second one because I love how it ends. And it's yeah. just because, and then my mind just starts going, well, imagine where it's gonna go from here. Right. In your head, do you know where this story goes from here? Well, I don't think we're gonna make a second one. No. I mean, that's just not in our in And our I mean, that's a compliment. No, I, said, no, no, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I feel the same way. So. Mm -hmm. Even with that being said, it wasn't all that surprising when Warner Bros. announced they were more interested in a sequel. 
In fact, early reports implied that they'd be making an entire series of various origin stories. But Joker making so much money, with over $500 million in profits, along with huge cultural recognition, it was inevitable that the studio would be hungry for more especially after all the failures of the recent DC movies. But artistically, it's a lot more debatable whether a sequel is really necessary at all. What would happen if you threw your vape out of a plane? Bro, y'all go to pour whatever they say. Don't worry, my fume. The mouth wants the message that he want it up. The character of Arthur Fleck had made his descent into becoming the Joker. It sent the message that he wanted to send. With how removed the film was from the comics and the DC universe in general, it also seemed odd for a sequel to expand on that side of things. Of course, both Joaquin Phoenix and the director Todd Phillips needed to be on board for a sequel to happen. Joker had made both of them incredibly rich, so the promise of more money didn't seem like it would make the difference. In earlier interviews, Todd Phillips has said that he only wants to make a sequel if he found a way to, quote, create thematic resonance with the first film. It would obviously explore some of the themes, but the question still remained of how to progress the story in the film's message. Joaquin Phoenix was also pretty cagey, saying that he also couldn't see how they could make an authentic sequel. To even say that there's more to do. I don't know that there is. There is. But you're not closed-minded about it. No, and it's... They should have stuck know, with that good. I mean, Todd would still be shooting now if, <laughs> if we could, right? Because it, it seemed endless. Clearly, though, they eventually landed on a plan. And we didn't hear anything about the sequel for two years until it was later revealed that a sequel was still in the works in 2021. Then the details came later. In early 2020, the title was revealed, with it being a reference to a mental illness shared between two people. Of course, people immediately suspected that the film would include Harley Quinn, but it was still just speculation. With how focused on loneliness and isolation the first film was, though, it did raise some eyebrows. People's uncertainty about the sequel only grew later in the year. In August, we got the first concrete details about the film other than the title. When it was revealed that Lady Gaga was central to the project, it was all but confirmed that the sequel would at least partially focus on Harley Quinn. But that news paled in comparison to the fact that it was also going to be a musical. The very act of performing had been central to the first film. A lot of its mass appeal can be pinned down to the famous dancing scene that dominated the internet for weeks afterwards. But the choice of making it a full-blown musical was still a very risky one. Considering the first film's audience and who it appealed to, it didn't seem like there would be that much overlap. Even all the way until the film's release, it didn't seem like Warner Bros or anyone else were entirely sure whether it was a musical, musical either. Wow. It was clear that there were lots of songs and musical numbers, but they were still hedging their bets. Even in an interview just before the first screenings, Lady Gaga stated that it wasn't truly a musical. That we approached music in this film was very special and extremely nuanced. Uh, I, I wouldn't I necessarily say that this is actually a musical in a lot of ways. It's uh, very different. The way that music is used is to really give the characters a way to express what they need to say. The director also said it wasn't a musical, but that music and songs played an essential role. For fans of the first film, it seemed like a massive shift. For critics, it seemed like the film might not have a real sense of its own identity. People were still excited because of the first film, but a lot of signs also pointed to disappointment. One of them being that now they didn't have Martin Scorsese's taxi driver to rely on, the film could just start unraveling and lose its core meaning. There were a few different ways they could have gone with it. They could have tried to make a real sequel, continuing on with the themes and the story of the first movie. But as we already mentioned, Joker just didn't really leave that much room for this. It could have even gone further into the DC universe side of things, expanding on other well-known characters and showing Joker's journey towards becoming a true villain. But the first film already showed how separate this universe was from all of that. There were actually rumors the first film wasn't even meant to be a DC Joker film until later on in its production. It makes sense as the only thing that really ties it to Batman in general are a few throwaway scenes and the names of the characters. The other option was to completely detach from all of that and just make what amounts to an entirely different movie. It did seem like they were going in that direction with the choice to make it a musical, but even that was only a half measure. One of the main fears people had about the film was that it would hedge its bets not really expanding on or progressing the story of the first film, but also not really doing anything new or interesting either. And it only got more likely when you look back at the director's track record. He also made The Hangover, which was so successful that it led to some unnecessary sequels that didn't really live up to the first movie. With all of that being said, the trailers they released put some people's minds to rest. They were smooth, giving just enough away about the film to interest people, but without spoiling it too much. They proved that, if anything, the cinematography and the general look of the movie was still going to be good. Lady Gaga's prominent place in the marketing also made people think that she would play a giant role. On the other hand, the trailers didn't reach nearly as many people. The final trailer for the original film, now sits at over 100 million views, but only around 30 million have seen the trailer to the sequel. It was already clear that the new Joker movie had to be exceptional to live up to the first movie. 
but things only got more uncertain when the first reviews started coming out. Unlike some films, critics got to see this weeks in advance of the general public, and they published their reviews before the film even came out. Just like the first movie, their initial opinions were divided, maybe even more than before. On the day before it was released, the Rotten Tomatoes score sat at a measly 45%, mm. meaning over half of the critics weren't impressed. Some of them described it as listless and a chore to sit through. Others enjoyed some parts of it like Joaquin Phoenix and Lady Gaga's performances, but they were still frustrated with how the film didn't really have a reason to exist. Even the positive reviews acknowledged that it would split audiences. Of course, they didn't really know what was going on in the first movie either. Most of Hollywood only started praising it once they realized everybody else liked it. But as the release date came and went, it became clear to nearly everyone that the new Joker movie wasn't going to live up to people's expectations. The movie bombed hard, with user reviews falling to well under 40% on Rotten Tomatoes. The momentum that the first film had created vanished almost immediately, and there were a whole bunch of problems. Instead of continuing the story or the plot of the first movie, the new Joker tried to go back on nearly all of it. It was like they were trying to stick it to the fans for the first film. All the subtext about society and alienation and mental illness pretty much vanished. Instead, the Joker was reframed as a punching bag. It feels like direct retaliation to how people saw him in the first movie. This new Joker movie clearly wants nothing to do with the original film, which was defined by its tension and its sense of impending doom. In the sequel, as that's already happened, it struggles to know where to go next. It means the film spends most of its runtime going nowhere. If some critics found it boring, then audiences found it excruciatingly slow. The songs never even seemed to progress the plot or the characters. The only thing it did is seemingly slow it all down. Of course, there were some good parts. The intro sequence stands out, as well as the cinematography. But even as a musical, it still doesn't work. It's another example of the film taking a middle ground that doesn't satisfy anyone. Lady Gaga's Hardy Quinn is underused and underwritten. They even took out some of the most important parts of the character's background. Instead of the Joker managing to indoctrinate a trained medical professional, she's just another patient at Arkham. It's another choice that only really serves to make this version of the Joker even more pathetic. There was a lot to justify. The film needed a reason to actually have been made, but it never finds a good one. Instead, the two real reasons it created slowly became clear. First, it clearly wants to sabotage the first film and its audience, either by twisting parts of the story it established, or by reframing its characters in different ways. Now, we won't go into the ending, but it's clearly been written to annoy people who like the first one. Then, the elephant in the room, the money. We already knew that neither Todd Phillips or Joaquin Phoenix even wanted to make this movie. They knew it was a completed story, and repeatedly said they wouldn't budge on a new film. But multi-million dollar payouts and a quadruple budget makes it all too tempting. For a modern Hollywood movie, Joker was made on a shoestring budget, and it overperformed massively because it was so resonant. Here, we've seen the exact opposite. A ton of money being wasted on a film that would drop off in days. It's almost ironic to see this happen to the Joker. Nobody cares how much a film costs. People care about quality and if a film is actually saying something. As a much more faithful adaption of the Joker once said, Not about money. It's about sending a message. He was the best Joker, R.I.P. Um, yeah, looks like they fumbled this one. I still kind of want to see it though. <laughs> I'm curious how it plays out. And you know, just because a lot of other people don't like it don't mean you won't like it. So, you know, I definitely am proving this over and over again. Um, so I might still watch it. I don't know if I'm gonna run to the theaters and watch it. I might wait for streaming though, to be honest. I'm not gonna be in a rush to watch it. That's what I did with the first one. But when I finally saw the first one, I was like, this is so good. Like, I, I wish I would've saw this in theaters. So I don't know. If y'all have seen it, y'all let me know what y'all opinions are. But let me know what y'all think. Let me know what other videos you wanna watch and I'll see y'all the next time. Bye.